pet. And, um, yeah. So that's the... All right. I started recording it so I wouldn't forget. Um, I'm going to hit broadcast and then I'm going to share my screen and start playing the video. Webinar is now live. Oh, yeah. And I got to broadcast it on uh, Facebook too. Facebook. Share in a minute. We're thinking, we're thinking. Oh, and we're live. All right, rock and roll. Uh, cool. Sharing the screen. Intros to come. Hi, my name is Derek Hanley. I'm an assistant professor of English at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Also taught at the United States Naval Academy in the English department from 2014 until 2017. Where I worked alongside Jack Ryan, who is a co-owner of Fairwinds CrossFit. I'm looking forward to this upcoming book discussion on my favorite novel, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, as well as our discussion on Ifimo Olua's So You Want to Talk About Race. Hope you can join us. Take care. Hello, my name is Audrey Wood Clark. I am an associate professor of English at the United States Naval Academy, where I specialize in Asian American and multi ethnic literature. My first book, The Asian American Avant Garde, conceptualizes Asian American modernism. My second book, Postmodern Players, which is currently under review, focuses on the ethnic player and masculinities as a response to postmodern wars. My first chapter is actually on Ellison's Invisible Man, so I'm really looking forward to talking more about the book with all of you on the 26th. I am also a very happy member of Fairwinds CrossFit. I've been going there for a year now. I met Jack Ryan through the Naval Academy, and I'm really looking forward to our book club discussion on the 26th. Uh, for a variety of different reasons, but mostly because I believe the Black Lives Matter movement has been doing a great job of articulating a diversity of voices. I think our discussion on the 26th will only add to that discussion. Race matters, and I think that the more we talk about race, the more things will improve in our society. Hello, my name is Devon Brown, and I am the co-founder and president of Political Affairs for the Navajo Coalition of Black Progressives. I am also one of the main characters of the award-winning documentary, The Boys of Baraka. I'm very excited to be able to join uh, Fairwinds CrossFit Book Club on the 26th for a very important discussion around systematic racism and inequality in communities of color. I think the work uh, that Jack Ryan and his staff is doing is amazing. And it is my hope uh, that this important discussion and this dialogue uh, will inspire each and every one of you, uh, no matter your race, your occupation, your zip code, it uh, doesn't matter. I hope that you will be inspired uh, to leave the discussion asking, what can I do to help to get involved so that we can put an end to systematic racism in this country? Thank you, and I look forward to seeing each and every one of you. Hi, I'm Kale Bauer, and I guess you can say I'm a member of the Fairwinds family by association. My husband, Drew, is one of the original members of the gym. And you really are a great family. 
because I'm one of those relatives that only shows up for dessert and you keep welcoming me back. I was excited when Jack reached out to ask me to be part of this panel. For the past four years, I've been working on the census communications campaign for the 2020 census. And it's our job and challenge to figure out how to make ads that are diverse and inclusive and speak to different populations across the country. So that means we had to do some extensive research into different races and ethnicities, different uh, communities across the country to figure out what motivates them. What are some barriers for them in working with government? And what are their, just their attitudes in general about today? And I've learned so much. But I realized in these past couple of weeks, there's a lot more to learn. So I'm really looking forward to digging into these books with you guys. I want to figure out how we can take what we learn from the books and with what we learn from our discussions with each other to make us better. I know I want to become a better person, a better parent, a better communicator, just a better member of society. So I'm really looking forward to talking with you all on the 26th. Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Micheletti and I have been with Fairwinds CrossFit for about two and a half years. Um, I love being a member of this community and I am so grateful that they are putting together this panel and this audience to talk about some of the social injustices that are going on um, in today's nation and how we can just help better understand each other. And I think that they are doing a fabulous job of staying true to their mission of being curious, being consistent, but also being courageous. Um, and to talk about some of the things that we are going to be discussing is courageous. So I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. It's going to help all of us be better for our community and better for our world. So stay tuned. All right. Well, welcome. I'm only going to run through that once. It was long. It was, uh, it was good enough. And sorry, Rai, you're, uh, I don't know why your end got kind of chopped off at the end. Good uh, afternoon. My name is oh boy. Carlo Gabler. Um, when I was young, I was young once, and there we go. Well, welcome, folks. Uh, we have 25 people watching us, which is kind of cool, not to uh, make you any more nervous than I already am. Uh, I thought maybe we would just go around and uh, put faces to names with all the panelists here for our first Fairwinds book club panel. I was, uh, I was thinking, Audrey and Derek, that I'd rename it uh, the Fairwinds CrossFit Cultural Anthenaeum, but I, uh, I had to redefine Anthenaeum for myself. I couldn't remember exactly what it stood for, but uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. So yeah, um, let's start uh, maybe, Audrey, with you, and then we'll go Kale, Derek, Rye, and and Yvonne, just sort of a, hi, this is who I am, and, uh, and I'm here. Hi, I'm Audrey. Thank you for coming tonight. Hey, guys. I'm Kale. Looking forward to talking with you all. Hi, I'm Derek. I'm excited to be here. Hey, I'm Ryan. Excited to be here as well. The silent type, Devon, Devon oh. there. Oh, so it's me. Okay, I just I, I, my my screen is much different than everyone. I didn't know. The I know, right? That's the best part. It's like in class sometimes when uh, when I tell people to go at the same time, like if we're doing lifts or whatever, I'll be like, and they're like, "Why are you grouping up?" So I'm like, "Because you're in the same quadrant in my screen. Is it the same for everyone else?" <laughs> yeah. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Devon Brown. Uh, nice. I'm glad, glad to be uh, a part of the conversation. Awesome. Well, again, I really appreciate you guys. Um, saying yes to do this on a Friday night at 6.30. Uh, Derek, I don't even know, what, what, what time zone are you on? Is it Central Mountain? Yeah, so a little bit earlier for him. You can still go get dinner afterwards. Central, yeah, Central time zone. We are going to, uh, just so the folks watching, um, we're gonna do this in kind of three main parts. Uh, we picked five excerpts from Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man that we're gonna, I have a audio recording of them and we're gonna play each of the five. I'll set them up before we do, kind of where they show up in the text. Um, so you can kind of follow along. If you have a hard copy, I'll also tell you the page number where it starts if you wanted to flip to it and kind of read along. 
but it's about 10 minutes, just under 10 minutes of some sound files that I'll be sharing over the over Zoom. The idea being that this text is long, it's pretty intense, and um, using it or having it be sort of a shared experience for all of us offers us a safe landing place that if we do start to dive into some touchier, more um, you know, personal topics, we can always kind of come back to the text as that safe place to kind of talk about what we saw, what it made us feel, how it made us feel. And, um, and it offers that, you know, in the moment, shared contextual experience for everybody. And that's important if we're having these conversations about race, racism, um, inclusion, and uh, inequalities. What I feel might not be the same thing that Derek's felt, that Kayla's felt, but if we come back and have that shared experience about the text, it bridges maybe some of those differences. After that, each of the panelists will have an opportunity to kind of reflect and respond to their reactions to the readings, either individually or as a whole. And then each of the panelists will kind of ask each other questions and you guys get to watch along attendees. At that point though, we're gonna open up the Q&A and we've got um, the, uh, the wonderful Dr. Joan Shiflett, who's kind of in the background right now hidden, will be monitoring that Q&A and kind of curating it for questions that then attendees, you'll have the opportunity to, if you want to ask your question, she'll make you live and you can hear, we'll be able to hear you. And then if it's uh, questions generally for the panel, awesome. If it's for specific panelists, by all means, please let them know and you can ask them directly. And that'll be it. And we'll shoot to get out of here in about an hour and a half. So we'll send you all on your way, eight o'clock, no later than eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Sound cool? All right, I'll take the silence as uh, confirmation. So without further ado, our, uh, our first reading will come from the beginning of the text, the prologue section of Ellison's Invisible Man. It's a little bit of a jazzy interlude that, that starts it off. Um, so chuckles are authorized. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Invisible Man. I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe. Nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids. And I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus sideshows. It is as though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorting glass. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. Nor is my invisibility exactly a matter of a biochemical accident to my epidermis. That invisibility to which I refer occurs because of a peculiar disposition of the eyes of those with whom I come in contact. A matter of the construction of their inner eyes those eyes with which they look through their physical eyes upon reality. I, I am not complaining, nor am I protesting either. It is sometimes advantageous to be unseen, although it is most often rather wearing on the nerves. Then too, you're constantly being bumped against by those of poor vision, or again, you often doubt if you really exist. You wonder whether you aren't simply a phantom in other people's minds, say a figure in a nightmare, which the sleeper tries with all his strength to destroy. It's when you feel like this that, out of resentment, you begin to bump people back. And let me confess, you feel that way most of the time. You ache with the need to convince yourself that you do exist in the real world, that you're part of all the sound and anguish, and you strike out with your fists, you curse, and you swear to make them recognize you. And, alas, it's seldom successful. All right, so our, can you guys hear me? Uh, still cool. Our next reading will come from... Uh, chapter six on page 141 that's the on my version uh and it the scene is our narrator's gotten into a little bit of trouble uh at the college and he's in mr or uh, dr bledsoe's office basically being read the riot act and dr bledsoe works himself up into a bit of a speech about the uh, nature of power and the systemic nature of white power and his role in that dynamic <laughs> Boy, you are a fool, he said. <laughs> 
your white folk didn't teach you anything, and your mother wit has left you cold. <laughs> what has happened to you young Negroes? I thought you, you had caught on to how things are done down here, but you don't even know the difference between the way things are and the way they're supposed to be. My God, he gasped. What is the race coming to, uh, boy? You can tell anyone you like. Sit down there. Sit down, sir, I say. Reluctantly, I sat, torn between anger and fascination, hating myself for obeying. Tell anyone you like, he said, I don't care. I wouldn't raise my little finger to stop you, because I don't owe anyone a thing, son. Who? Negroes? <laughs> Negroes don't control this school or much of anything else. Haven't you learned even that? No, sir, they don't control this school, nor white folk either. True, they support it, but I control it. Eyes big and black, and I say, yes, sir, as loudly as any burhead when it's convenient. But I'm still the king down here. I don't care how much it appears otherwise. Power doesn't have to show off. Power is confident, self-assuring, self-starting, and self-stopping, self-warming, and self-justifying. When you have it, you know it. Let the Negroes snicker and the crackers laugh. Those are the facts, son. The only ones I even pretend to please are big white folk, and even those I control more than they control me. This is a power setup, son, and I'm at the controls. You think about that. When you buck against me, you're bucking against power, rich white folks' power, the nation's power, which means government power. All right, our third reading is going to come from chapter 13 on page 278. And this is, uh, our narrator has... Um, He's left his first day of the job at the plant, the, uh, the painting, the paint factory, has made his way back into Harlem and finds himself in the eviction situation that is about to become a riot and goes into his uh, speech on the idea of dis the dispossessed into um, give us our Jesus speech. Again, and Derek, this is the one that I said I like. I, had to go back and look at a couple times with some of the, the comments you had made. So here we go, page 278. And look at this old woman with her dog-eared Bible. What's she trying to bring off here? She's let her religion go to her head. But we all know that religion is for the heart, not for the head. Blessed are the pure in heart, it says. Nothing about the poor in head. What's she trying to do? What about the clear of head and the clear of eye, the ice water vision to see too clear to miss a lie? Look out there at her cabinet with its gaping drawers, 87 years to fill them, and full of brick and brack, a brick of brack, and she wants to break the law. What's happened to them? They're our people, your people and mine, your parents and mine. What's happened to them? I tell you, a heavyweight yelled, pushing out of the crowd, his face angry. Hell, they've been dispossessed, you crazy son of a bitch. Get out the way. Dispossessed, I cried, holding up my hand and allowing the word to whistle from my throat. That's a good word. Dispossessed. Dispossessed. 87 years. And dispossessed of what? They ain't got nothing. They can't get nothing. They never had nothing. So who was dispossessed, I growled. We're law-abiding. So who's being dispossessed? Can it be us? These old ones are out in the snow, and we're here with them. Look at their stuff. Not a pit to hiss in, nor a window to shout the news at us right with them. Look at them. Not a shack to pray in or an alley to sing the blues. They're facing a gun, and we're facing it with them. They don't want the world, but only Jesus. They only want Jesus. 15 minutes of Jesus on the rug bare floor. Huh. How about it, Mr. Law? Do we get our 15 minutes worth of Jesus? You got the world. Can we have our Jesus? I got my orders, Mac, the man called, waving the pistol with a sneer. You're doing all right telling them to keep out of this. This is legal, and I'll shoot if I have to. All right, our fourth reading is going to move us pretty late in the text. This is the, the penultimate chapter, the, the last actual chapter before the, the epilogue. Um, page 559, and our narrator has uh, found himself in his final confrontation with 
Raz the Destroyer and um, kind of a commentary on his reflection of Raz and a lot of the other figures that he's come up against throughout the novel. I looked at Ross on his horse and at their handful of guns and recognized the absurdity of the whole night and of the simple yet confoundingly complex arrangement of hope and desire, fear and hate that had brought me here still running and knowing now who I was and where I was and knowing too that I had no longer to run for or from the Jacks and the Emersons and the Bledsoes and the Nortons but only from their confusion, impatience, and refusal to recognize the beautiful absurdity of their American identity and mine. I stood there, knowing that by dying, that by being hanged by Ross on this street in this destructive night, I would perhaps move them one fraction of a bloody step closer to a definition of who they were and of what I was and had been. But the definition would have been too narrow. I was invisible. And hanging would not bring me to visibility, even to their eyes, since they wanted my death not for myself alone, but for the chase I'd been on all my life because of the way I'd run, been run, chased, operated, purged. Although, to a great extent, I could have done nothing else given their blindness. But didn't they tolerate both Reinhardt and Bledsoe and my invisibility? And that I, a little black man with an assumed name should die because a big black man in his hatred and confusion over the nature of a reality that seemed controlled solely by white men whom I knew to be as blind as he was just too much, too outrageously absurd. And I knew that it was better to live out one's own absurdity than to die for that of others, whether for Rosses or Jacks. And our last reading is going to come from the, the epilogue. And kind of that final word, um, it's, not, it's not the actual end of the text, but I um, felt it kind of it summed up some of the, the conflict or the, the, the unsolved, one of the many unsolved conflicts of this text. So this is on page 579. Sometimes I feel the need to reaffirm all of it, the whole unhappy territory and all the things loved and unloved in it, for all of it is part of me. Till now, however, this is as far as I've ever gotten, for all life seen from the whole of invisibility is absurd. So why do I write torturing myself to put it down? Because in spite of myself, I've learned some things. Without the possibility of action, all knowledge comes to one labeled file and forget, and I can neither file nor forget, nor will certain ideas forget me. They keep filing away at my lethargy, my complacency. Why should I be the one to dream this nightmare? Why should I be dedicated and set aside? Yes, if not to at least tell a few people about it. There seems to be no escape. Here, I've set out to throw my anger into the world's face. But now that I've tried to put it all down, the old fascination with playing a role returns, and I'm drawn upward again, so that even before I finish, I failed. Maybe my anger is too heavy. Perhaps being a talker, I've used too many words. But I've failed. The very act of trying to put it all down has confused me and negated some of the anger and some of the bitterness. So it is that now I denounce and defend or feel prepared to defend. I condemn and affirm, say no and say yes, say yes and say no. I denounce because though implicated and partially responsible, I have been hurt to the point of abysmal pain, hurt to the point of invisibility. And I defend because in spite of all, I find that I love. In order to get some of it down, I have to love. I tell you no phony forgiveness. I'm a desperate man. But too much of your life will be lost. It's meaning lost, unless you approach it as much through love as through hate. So I <laughs> approach it through <clears throat> division. So I denounce and defend. I hate and I love. <laughs> All right. So there you go. For those who uh, were not English majors and uh, you only took that one English class your freshman year of college or, you know, last year of high school, whenever you did your last English class, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you for tolerating me to do that. That was my own little selfish pleasure of uh, a, a live reading. Not that I had to read it. Um, so, but I turn it over to you guys, to the, the panelists. I, I'm very intrigued to hear your reactions. And uh, we drew straws. Derek drew the, the short straw. So he will be going first. Uh, well, first of all, thanks, Jack, for inviting me. It's great to be uh, a part of this discussion, and, and I'm honored to be 
invited into inside the Fairwinds uh, CrossFit community. Um, I miss my Annapolis family, and uh, hopefully when everything gets back to normal, I'll come back and visit. Um, I was really excited when you um, invited me to be part of this conversation. I first read Invisible Man as a freshman in college, um, Hampton University, uh, many moons ago. And I read the novel probably every year afterwards for at least 10 or 12 years. And what's was wonderful and what's so beautiful and what's so profound about Ralph Ellison's novel is how relevant it remains. It was relevant in 92 during the Rodney King riots. It was relevant during the housing crisis in 2008, which disproportionately um, affected African Americans who lost their homes or were, were evicted. And it's, and it's definitely relevant today to what's being discussed, the protests, the, the whole Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and I hear that in particular when you look at the prologue um, that you read, and, and it just really hit me as, as I was listening to it, the last two sentences of the prologue. Um, you ache with the need to convince yourself that you do exist in the real world. First of all, that you exist, that you're a part of all the sound and anguish, and you strike out with your fists. You curse and you swear to me recognize you, and at last it's seldom successful. You swear to make them recognize you. Black lives matter, and some refuse to recognize, and they want to keep saying all lives matter. And that is, that is the brilliance of, of, of Ralph Ellison, and that's why it's one of the great American novels. Um, shows, it, it gives a prism to, to the ways in which African Americans have existed in this and, and, and continue to exist. So I'm going to stop there and let the other panelists jump in. But those are some of my thoughts. Thanks, Derek. That's that's awesome. I, I I wrote and underlined relevance, right? That relevancy. That's yeah. And, and I'm I'm curious if anybody asks the like what elements of it. You know what I mean? That that sense of what makes it so. But that's that's my own. I wrote it down though, so I can ask later if somebody forgets. Um, anyone want to jump in? I'll jump in. Um, so I read um, Invisible Man actually in graduate school for my orals exam, and it was actually the last line of the novel um, of Invisible Man. Who knows? But that on lower frequencies, I speak for you. That actually helped me pass my oral ex exam um, because I was so flummoxed as to what I should say, and then I just quoted it, and you know, my professors were actually really impressed that I remembered it. Um, but it, what struck me about the line was that there's a kind of counter-universalism that's happening here, like an African-American isn't often thought as a universal figure, right? But he's actually performing what the universal figure could look like, right? And so that makes people pause and think, oh, an African-American man, who isn't even named in this text could actually stand in for all of us, right? And that helps us understand the nature of the invisibility that Derek read in the prologue. Um, so going back to the prologue, um, you know, this this prologue, it's funny, it, I've never heard of the audio uh, version read before, so I was really surprised when it was kind of jazzy, um, because to me, the prologue has always seemed really melancholic, meaning that there's a sense of psychic loss there. Um, it's like, no matter what he does, right, he's still invisible. And so um, towards the end, this, the second paragraph of the prologue, he says, um, you wonder whether you aren't simply a fan in other people's minds, say a figure in a nightmare which the sleeper tries with all his strength to destroy. It's when you feel like this, out of resentment, you begin to bump people back, and let me confess, you feel that way most of the time. You ache with the need to convince yourself that you do exist in the real world. Um, and then he goes on to say, and you strike out with your fists, you curse and you swear. And what's really striking about this is like the, it's like the, lose-lose situation of being the invisible man, right? Like you're invisible, when you actually make your feelings known, then you're deemed a criminal, right? 
And so um, that's the that's the kind of most melancholic condition I think that he is articulating here, um, and it's something that really haunts the whole novel. So that when Bledsoe is talking to him and scolding him, right, for bringing Mr. Norton out, um, and he says, you know, I've got it all figured out, right? Like I am, I am the African American who has all the power, right? I pretend to please our, all the big white folk, and you know, you're bucking against power, rich white right, white folks' power. Um, but really, it's it, it, it's a performance, but is it really being recognized, right? In some ways, Bledsoe isn't much more elevated than the Invisible Man, right? And so, um, again, it's this really melancholic disposition. And that's all I have to say for now. That's awesome. I really wish I could take a time machine and go take one of your classes. <laughs> Uh, all right. Who's following that one? It's like. <laughs> oh sure. I mean, I guess I guess my mic is unmuted, but it looks like when it was looked like he was getting ready ready to say the uh, speak to if you wanted to jump in for me. But um, oh yeah. Oh uh, well. So yeah. I mean, I mean, I think um, they both hit on 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 some good points. I think uh, uh, Professor Dark. Uh, the when I first read the uh, prologue, which was the day, I, I, had, I actually haven't read the entire book, um, but I've read a lot of the um, of the excerpts that you sent, and I think the first uh, the uh, prologue stood out to me um, when talking about the invisibility of black men, right? And so to piggyback off of what Professor said is, we have to really take a look at why he feels invisible. I think that is that is a very important piece. Is why does he feel invisible? Why do black people in America feel invisible? And so what I did was I took some time to look up uh, some stats. When we look at mass incarceration, when we look at the the disparities amongst African Americans in America. Uh, African Americans that are incarcerated, we are incarcerated uh, more than five times the rate of whites. Uh, when you look at uh, you look at health, African Americans have the highest mortality rate for all cancers combined uh, compared to any other race. Um, we are you know, more likely to deal with, um, with suicidal thoughts uh, than whites. Uh, there's huge disparities amongst African Americans that is systematically put in place to keep us down. And this is why uh, many African Americans feel invisible because when we look at not only, you know, again, when you look at the health disparities in terms of, you know, the African Americans being more likely to have heart disease, cancer, high blood pressure, and all these things, you say, well, how can this be? Well, if you look into the communities and you see that you go to, especially for me growing up in Baltimore City, uh, you go to any corner, you see Chinese fast food restaurants. You don't see any uh, whole food stores. You don't see any healthy produce stores. Uh, you see liquor stores and you see fast food restaurants. And so uh, when you talk about food deserts, and so this is the leading cause of why, you know, we have high blood pressure and, thing, and things like that. So when I was reading the prologue and I was thinking, you know, well, what is it that makes them feel invisible? What makes us feel invisible? What can I say to speak to the audience today to, to, to get them to say, well, why, why do black people feel invisible? Uh, it is it, it is those it, it is those things. It is those health disparities. It's those economic disparities, um, and you know it's the educational disparities. But within our educational system, uh, it is it is all those things. And so when you're fighting with so much, you know, being a black man, you almost feel like you're not visible. And so the whole fact that um, we have to march and to protest to get people to understand that Black Lives Matter. Is, is, is more of a reason why uh, what this author has wrote, written and what this man thinks is so important to today, as Professor said, is that this book is still relevant to today. The fact that we have to convince society that we are here, um, even in 2020, uh, is, is, it, is, it is mind blowing. And um, I think if we look at the why, I think we'll better under, understand uh, what this book is really trying to say. I think Devon makes an excellent point there. Um, so I'm going to go back to two things. So the Black Lives Matter movement, it says like 
in their mission, what they're about. Every day we recommit to healing ourselves and each other and to co-creating alongside of comrades, allies, and family, a culture where each person feels seen. That's the first thing that they say, so that each person feels seen, heard, and supported, okay? And vision is a symbol all throughout Ellison's novel. And I think it's just really, it hones the point where the first thing on the Black Lives Matter, their missions is that each person feels seen. Um, so I wanted to go there. And then next, Devon's point, let me go back. There was something I wanted to say. One second. Jeez, it's gonna come back to me. But there, there was a great point that you had, but I'm sure it'll come back to me. Sorry, guys. So I think I wanna jump in and that, I think that the black population feels that they're invisible. And I think unfortunately they are invisible. So coming from where I work at the census where we're supposed to count everyone, the black population is one of the highest undercounted populations across the country. And so if you're not, if we don't have that accurate picture of the country, communities across the nation lose out on things. And so when we're trying to figure out how do we make sure everyone is counted? How do we get everyone the power and the money they deserve? Because that's what the census is about. It's about getting power by representation and getting money and funding for your communities. So we had to do a ton of research and we found that the black community has three main barriers. They are distrustful of government more than any other uh, minority and definitely more than non-Hispanic whites. They have a fear of repercussions. So back when Ellison's talking about government power, there's still that feeling that the government's going to use their information against them. And then there's also concerns about privacy and confidentiality. So this book really kind of brought to the forefront for me while I think we've done better than we've done in the past, we still need to do even better than that. Because in part of making a community feel that they're seen is showing everyone that they are there. My thought came back to me, guys. So <laughs> um, the invis invisibility point that Devon was talking about, um, just from a business standpoint and working in predominantly like white environments, um, it's like with each accomplishment we have or just the audience we have, we're always speaking for the black people. Like we're always looked at if we are the minority in the room and there, you have a question, we're the answer for everybody. And so that all the individual African Americans are therefore invisible. Does that make sense, panel? Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, I was gonna say too, if, if, if I can, with uh, Cali's point, um, speaking of the census, I think that that was a really big thing that I wanted to, to get out with this past census. Um, and to the black community and how important it is for us to fill out the census inf 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 information because yeah, you are correct. You know, you're basically counted, you basically get your funding. Uh, you know, they, you know, when you do your census, that's how all the funding comes. But one of the, the problems with the census and with the government and, and to the point why so many people are, you know, they don't really trust, trust the government, but the process of the census as well um, when you look at people living in public housing and things like that, a lot of them do not have the necessary technology, the Wi-Fi, and all that stuff to be able to even go on to fill out um, the information needed to be counted. And so, um, you know, when you look at filling out, out, out the census, the reason why a lot of them don't fill it out too um, is because, because of these disparities. They don't, you know, they can't afford to, mm -hmm. some of them can't afford to have a laptop. They don't have necessary, um, you know, Wi-Fi to be able to go online and fill it up. Um, you know, some of them probably, you know, some of them probably moving from house to house. And so now you, because, because they're just trying to get by. So even if they mail the census in, you know, you get this, you know, you get this thing in the mail 
and you know you you know you got to open it up you got to read it you, you may not even be there you know in a week or two so it's a lot of things that we have to think about um and i really think that change you know even though a lot of senses you get a lot of federal money i think a lot of change is going to ha have to happen on a local level um with organizations with businesses uh like fair ones to be able to get involved to to, to, to say, how can we be a voice? You know, how can, you know, our university, you know, as a professor, how can I, you know, how can I be a voice? What, what can we do to make sure that we're providing the necessary uh, resources for um, low income communities to make sure that they can fill out the census so that, they, so that their voices can be heard? Uh, how can we have these type of discussions so that we can create an understanding of the needs of these communities? Um, you know, and so that's, that's just some thoughts that was in my mind. No, I'm, I'm with you. And I think we need leaders like you, right? Because yes, you can fill out the census online if you have a computer and Wi-Fi, but you can also call. There's 800 numbers that you can call. And if you don't, we're going to send people out to knock on doors to help people fill it out. So we need trusted voices in the community like yourself to tell people that it's important, it's easy, and it's safe. Yes. And the benefits that you're going to get from this last for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So black children are undercounted at twice the rate of white children, which means that it's a whole childhood that you're missing out on in the 10 years it takes to get from census to census. So we look at the schools around here and there's trailers outside of all of them. But if we have an accurate count of what we're expecting, schools can plan for that and funding can be allocated so kids aren't learning in trailers in the back of a school so it's i think we really need that local trusted voices to really help get that word out about how important it is i have a question um i was uh struck by uh, i think it was ryan you said it the um the sense of Ellison's theme of vision and just of being seen. Um, I don't know if we talked about it before, but just the, the irony of he works at a paint factory that's known for how white of paint it can make. Um, when he gets the, I mean, it's a chemical lobotomy, sort of the, the chemical stripping of all of his um, color and the, the, just the, the stuff that makes him him at each stage of the the you know as the novel progresses and Derek and Audrey this is kind of a question for you two in the sense of you know did Ellison have a sense of um that being a theme for just the the novel and what um you know African-American culture was experiencing at the time kind of sort of post Harlem Renaissance and and maybe why this is a big question. What it's um, what has facilitated that kind of continuing on now, almost sixty years later. Like, what what is it that's been lost? Maybe what is it? Is is there anything that you think Alu talks about that to improve that sense of seeing each other? If that that question makes sense. Go ahead, Audrey. Um, so he was writing this in the 1950s. Um, and it, um, in my research of this novel, he was really influenced by the contemporary Korean War. But what was really fascinating to me about it was that it was written about the 1930s. And that was the period of the Great Depression. There were a lot of, um, you know, like the CPUSA was really huge at that time. Um, and it really had gained traction, but what was really interesting is that the novel is such a critique of the brotherhood um, and American communism. Um, but I think that in some ways, the solidarity that it invited, right, kind of, like, kind of um, prophesied, I would say, like Black Lives Matter, right? Like he, I think he's wanting a kind of um, productive protest, right? But not one in which 
he will lose his identity, right? Like I, I think about, um, I actually highlighted this passage when Brother Jack, who is the leader of the Brotherhood or the Communist Party says on page 309, this is your new identity, Brother Jack said, open it. Inside I found a name written on a slip of paper. That is your new name, Brother Jack said. Start thinking of yourself by that name from this moment. Get it down so that even if you are called in the middle of the night, you will respond. Um, and that renaming is so tyrannical, right? It's like, in order to be a part of this party that you would belong to, I get to rename you. I, I as a white man, get to rename you. Um, and that is really traumatic, right? And he has to accept it to be a part of this political solidarity. And I, I think that he's criticizing it at that moment in the 1930s. Um, but a kind of political solidarity now that wouldn't rob people of their names is maybe what he was hoping for. I was about to make a bad joke. I, you know, they were communists. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't pick up on that. <laughs> uh. Well, Jack, if I can also, um, you 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 mentioned the paint. Um, it's sort of symbolic, right? That you need black drops to make make white paint whiter. Uh, and it's being, and it can only be done well by the. Um, the older black guy that, you know, not college educate, educated, not an engineer, not, but he's the only one. And when he went on sick leave or when he got sick, you know, it took that for him, his absence for them to realize that they needed him. Sorry. Yeah. I, right. That they needed him, that, you know, the power he had, but you know, he's still not being treated as such, but, uh, but it's just, it just made me think, um, about how in American society or the history of America, and um, and I recommend Nell Irv Painter's book, The History of Whiteness, how some ethnic groups when they came to the United States weren't white, right? Um, it was only um, second or third generation or things that folks evolved into whiteness. Um, there's this essay in 1898 talking about the problems with American immigration. Too many immigrants are coming over from from Eastern Europe and 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 and, and however, you know, and, and today over a period of time, some of these ethnic groups are now um, are considered are considered white. In uh, Audrey was talking about the 1930s. You look at some of the um, the early 20th century race riots and these tensions between certain ethnic groups in, in the urban North, um, not wanting African Americans to live in, in their, in their neighborhoods. I mean, it's, it's all about having this, this goal, this achievement of, 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 of whiteness. So this idea that you need, you need, you need to keep blackness in a certain place in order to, to achieve whiteness. I'm taking myself off on mute. Do you think um, it is, uh, I just, as you were saying that, I, I flipped to Lowe's section on the model minority. And I know she, she even openly says, you know, it's the, uses the Asian Pacific, um, Asian American and Pacific Islander as kind of the example, knowing though that there are other examples that's just the one that, that she chose to sort of explore and the the idea being that um these complaints are often met with an uh, sorry i went too far um when we think of being a model for a group we think of being someone to aspire to for many people in the asian american and pacific islander community who complain about the model minority myth this argument that being a model minority is not actually something to complain about is often used to silence them. So to say like, what are you complaining about? You're the model minority. That sense of the more you shed your racial identity the, and moving towards the model white identity, the more you become invisible as what makes you you. Is that, I mean, I, I feel like, right? Like I feel like that's a very similar sort of that, the myth of the model minority is the problem. Like that's, that, that there is a myth that that is a goal to strive to, that that's the achievement of whiteness to get to. Is that 
similar to kind of what you were saying, Derek, or, and Audrey, please jump in. Go ahead, Derek. Um, I'm going to think about that. <laughs> Second, Jack, I'm going to think about that. Um, I guess, right, I mean, if we think of whiteness as an ideal, right? Right. Uh, so um, that is, a, you know, for a group of people, a, a goal to achieve. So are you, are you saying whiteness as being the model in which minorities are trying to Right. And that's, that's the problem that if that's the myth, right. And we call, because the language, and again, like, uh, Alou does a great job of kind of unpacking the language, language matters, words are where we get our ideas and where we get our sense of culture and where we get our ideals and morals from. I call it the model. The unspoken model is white. That's, and that's the, the goal or the myth to you're trying to achieve. That's the problem. And so instead of saying like, well, why doesn't everyone just act more white? I don't know what the problem is. We say, oh, no, no, we're, we're striving for a goal. We want to get to this like melting pot and blah, 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 like whatever, whatever myth you want to layer on top of there or hide it behind. What we're really saying is stop being so black, stop being so whatever, stop being that, be more white. And that's the problem. Like that's, I feel the, what the myth hides and what she was saying is, Rather than saying it's a compliment, it's just another way of silencing a whole group of people. Mm, okay. Um, so Claire Jean Kim in Bitter Fruit writes about the different intersectionalities of races in the United States, and she compares African Americans and Asian Americans, which Aluo does in this book. Um, but she says that um, Asian Americans who are often think, thought of as model minority um, are the forever foreigners. So they, they seem white, right? But they never really actually are. And in fact, um, that term only came about post-1965 um, after the Immigration Act of 1965 in which um, the Asian Americans that came over at that point were all of a professional class. And so everyone was zooming in on their socioeconomic class, but the Asian Americans who had been here before that were mostly laborers. Um, and so it's really, I mean, if you want to look at class, that's a different thing, but it came in immigration waves. Um, but the problem with, I mean, so again, you have this kind of stereotypical Asian American who, you know, strives and goes to an Ivy League school and becomes an investment banker or a, a doctor or whatever. Um, and that is seen as the model minority. But the problem with that term is that it does silence them, but it also kind of like makes them these um, tokens that that kind of erases all of their effort, first of all. Um, and then also there are plenty of Asian Americans who are not smart and who are poor. Um, and so I think that really unfairly, um, it unfairly encapsulates a, a population that is not necessarily representative of a whole racial population. Um, and so, uh, and then also, yeah, so, uh, Kim says that Asian Americans are seen as model, like for, foreign, but uh, superior, but African Americans are seen as native, but inferior. And those two characteristics are really, really problematic. And that's our uncomfortable silence. <laughs> <laughs> No, well, I was going to say, I was going to add, add, add something um, uh, to that point. I was, I, you know, I was also reading that that, that was a research uh, that was done um, by the Pew Research Center. Um, and they, so they basically did a study on race and just whiteness in America. And what, what, what was alarming is that they, they said more than four in 10 Americans say that the country still has work to do to give black people uh, you know, equal rights with whites, um, and that blacks in particular are skeptical that black people would never um, have uh, e equal rights in this country. But but what was also but but the main point the the, the main one was that um, they so the study also showed it, it says that Americans generally think that being white is an advantage in society, while about half or more say that 
being black or Hispanic hurts people's ability to get ahead. And so the whole notion that, yeah, speaking of just whiteness, is just that just doing a study and for half of people to think that, you know, being white, like being white is like an advantage that I think that even some white people don't even think that they have. Because even when you still say it, when you talk about like white privilege, stuff like that, you still get a handful of white, well, not a handful, but a ton more of a handful that's just like, oh, there's no such thing as white privilege. There is no such thing as, as this. So it's like, man, you don't even understand. You don't even know the privilege that you have as being white in America, which is like alarming because, hey, you know, if you, know, if you ask people, a handful of people, would, would you rather not necessarily change your skin color, but get the privilege of, of being white, I'm sure everyone would raise, probably raise, raise a hand. So um, I, thought, I thought that was pretty interesting when I was reading those, those, those statistics. Another piece of silence. <laughs> I, I, got, I, do have a, I, I do have another question, though, too. I, I'd be curious, especially off of that, Devon, the idea of um, sort of this, uh, it, it made me think of the conversation between uh, Norton and the narrator as they're driving in the car. Um, I mean, granted, we see him again in the epilogue. He runs into him in the subway. But more important, when the, when the narrator is um, speaking with Mr. Norton, Norton makes a comment, and I'm paraphrasing. I can't find it quick enough in the text, but he, he paraphrases that you're my identity. All the students here at this university are my identity. That that your fate is my um, legacy, or or sort of this sense that that every single one of their successes, or um, the success of the you know, the black university, all of that, they don't get any credit for it. The, the individuals, the students, Norton, and all the trustees, and, and all of these rich northern white men, it's their legacy, it's their identity. So, so basically, my privilege, if I'm, if I'm that Norton character, my privilege continues to extend, even though it's your work, it's your future, it's your effort, it's, it's actually to me. And that, I think, that when I read that, that struck me as like, that's that's the privilege that we're talking about. Like, he, no matter what this narrator does, no matter what the Invisible Man does, he will never get credit for it, whether it's criminal or good. It's all the same. It all just gets hijacked by somebody else. Yeah. And I think that's where we need to really step in and start young with children at least from my perspective i'm raising three white children if i don't make them aware of their privilege and what how they can use that privilege to help then i haven't done my job as a parent and i think that we really need to like it talk about how we can figure out how to put this into action like what can we take from these to figure out in the here and now what can we do to help make it better. I think so much of that just goes back to education and the school system and us not waiting until February to talk about some of the major things that African Americans have done and just the journey and the struggles. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that, you know, we've been teaching the same, well, you know, in elementary schools and stuff, teaching the same way forever. Yeah. And nothing has changed. Nothing, what we talk about has not really changed. Maybe post 9-11 and stuff like that. Um, and just what are the impacts of the things that were done in black, or, you know, just basically in history. So like slavery, what are those economic, psychological, all of those impacts have they had on today's society? Mm. You know, we, we never talk about that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and, it, and it can be just, like you say, February of Black History Month, is that Black history is American history. And until, until we treat it as such, whereas though that it's mandatory in, in our books, not just as some holiday that comes around once a month, like, oh, it's Black History Month, let's just talk about Dr. King, but really making it a part of curriculums um, starting in our middle schools and our high schools, 
to say that black history is a part of, of American history, of how everything was built, um, you, know, you know, how our roads were built, how our infrastructure was built. Um, you know, everything that you see around America at some point had black hands in it, and we need to make sure that it's recognized and that, um, that black people feel more, more inclusive to be here, that, is, that, that this notion, um, which is the thing that, that drives me crazy not to be political about what we're seeing today with Trump, of this make America great again, this is our country, we're taking it back. I, I guess that's what he's trying to say, is like, hey, we're gonna make this great again. It's like, you know, it, this, this, is, this is, America was built on the backs of blacks and that we have just as much of a right to be here and to claim this as our country um, than anyone else. Um, and that, and that, yes, that we all should feel included and that we all should feel welcome. And I think the invisibility, the, the part that hurts when you read this book or from, from the perspective of the author is that the sacrifices and the work that you put in um, to, 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 to Ryan's point, it, it just get to, to, to put your, your hard work into something and then have it snatched away from you. Um, and to be told that this is not yours. It's like, you know, I built, it's like, you know, I, I spent all my time building this or creating this and someone comes and take it away from you. Um, it's hurtful. And so to be an American, to be, a, to be an African American, to, to work hard, to go to work, to, to try to provide for your family, to do all the right things, to go get an education, to, to try to be, you know, to try to do what you can do to, to help this country. And if someone wants to take it away from you by saying, this is not your country, you know, this is our flag, this is, this is ours, we're gonna make it great again. It's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. I, I, I can't even really, <laughs> I can't really say the, I, I don't even know what to say, but to Ryan's point is like, um, what if that passage, yeah, like you know, it, to to build something and, and to and to be a part of something and have it taken away from you, um, is uh, I think is kind of what that one passage you were speaking on. And I, I know I was rambling. It's just not I at all. And actually, as you were going, Devon, you actually for me watching that, watching your description of it defined Audrey's term of the melancholia of the of the prologue. I couldn't. I was trying to like wrap my head around that that sense of melancholy or where it's not it's not apathy, it's not anger, it's not you know it, that the the narrator is just it's just it, he can't win. There's no and that it, it's almost it's not it's not even hopelessness. It's just yeah. invisibility. Yeah, yeah. It's it's well. Well, I was gonna make a joke, but probably it's not the time. <laughs> the time. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's like, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's like, you can't, it's like, you can't, because it's like, because it's even, it's like, even if you build your own, so, so there's this term, like, you know, well, you know, if we, you know, if you can't have a seat at, at the table, then you're on the menu, but there's some people say, well, let's build a table, but it's like, even if you try to build your own table, build your own thing, then it's like, it gets taken away from you, so it's like, you can never really win in America if you're, if you're a black man, right, um, and so it's, it's, and so I think that's what, that hints to what you to, 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 to the passage of yeah. what can you do to not, because even when you feel like you've taken a step ahead, there's always a step back. So even if a policy or a law gets passed to give, you know, equal rights or opportunities to blacks, there's some other thing that comes along that makes it even harder. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's, it's the way of life. And part of his, 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 his passage, uh, you know, He's like, you know, have you not learned? This is, it's not, uh, what, uh, you know, what, what did he say? He said, uh, this is a good point. He said, um, hold on, it's right here. Read this point. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, but you don't even know the difference between the way things are and the way things supposed to be. It's like, hey, some things, sometimes it's just, you know, it shouldn't be this way, but I guess, it, I mean, the, my uh, grandmother used to use the term, it, it is what it is. Hmm. It is what it is, but it shouldn't be. Um, and it's going to take all of us to stand up, to, to voice, you know, to, to allow our voices to be heard so that 
it, this isn't the way that America is and that everyone is seen and heard and that people are given as much credit for their work and their hard dedication as any, um, you know, as, as anyone else. And so Devon, oh, I was, I was just going to, to kick in with a couple questions before we get too backed up. Um, you guys are do, doing amazing, by the way. What an incredible panel. So thanks for everything you've said so far. Um, but so far, three questions uh, from Stacy, Mary, and Mike just added to this same kind of concept of what Devon was just talking about. Um, you know, we get from Olio, uh, we can get every person in America to feel nothing but love for people of color in their hearts. And if our systems aren't acknowledged and changed, it will bring negligible benefit to the lives of people of color. So we get that from her. And when you go to Ellison, um, kind of a, a, or a very, very related passage, when you go to the eviction scene, and it's the first time that our narrator, you know, he's observing this whole eviction scene, and he, he sees another white man, not the one who's running the eviction, but another white man comes in, and the white man says, we're friends of all the common people, he shouted. We came to help. We believe in brotherhood, another one called. And the narrator says, well, pick up that sofa and come on. But the narrator says, I was uneasy about their presence and disappointed when they all joined the crowd and started lugging the evicted articles back inside. And so, um, kind of paraphrasing Stacy Mary and Mike's question of, and, and going back to what Devon was just talking about, what is the role of a white ally? How do we not step on toes how how do we actually engage in this effort um and 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 what's our move forward and i think after that professor wallace don wallace also has a longer question but that seems to be on the minds of most of the folks asking questions i i was gonna add actually um to devon's point about it all being our history um and so um to your, the questions that you posed, Joan, um, to make good allies is to recognize that slavery is all of our histories, right? Like as Americans, it is our history, right? And so if we own that history and we recognize that we really messed up, right? Um, and we actually have to do everything that we can to make it better and it's our civic duty to make things better. Um, and then in terms of, like practicality, like how does that, what does that look like in practice? It actually is like, it's pretty intersectional, right? It's like, it's not just enough to say, um, you know, the, you know, this in this book, there's the invisible man, right? How about in this book, there are hardly any African American women, right? And so the only African American female character is Mary, right? His landlady, um, and who, who he like, you know, completely, um, cast aside when he leaves her her house and he breaks her statue, right? Um, and so Aluo says, I'm going to go back to Aluo's point because I, that's something that's really important in terms of allyship. She says um, on page 74, even though the Black Lives Matter, or even though Black Lives Matter was founded by Black women, even though Black women have been at the heart of every feminist movement in this country's history, nobody marches for us when we are raped, when we are killed, when we are denied work and equal pay. Nobody marches for us. Intersectionality, the belief that our social justice, justice movements must consider all of the intersections of identity, privilege, and oppression of that people, of, of that people face in order to be just and effective is the number one requirement of all of the work that I do. Um, and so I think that in terms of allyship, we should recognize there are intersectional identities too that are at stake. And so to kind of tread carefully, but to also recognize that it's our responsibility. Yeah, and I will, um, I must just just plug into to to your point. I to me, I, it's just my opinion. I think black women are probably uh, some of the most underrated uh, creatures on this earth, and deserve a ton of credit. Um, that's just that's just was just just a side note. I just think black women are phenomenal and do and are the least appreciated uh, human beings. And you know, it's and yeah. So to I. 
Yes, yes. I don't know. I just wanted to, to say that. Well, we know we know that Octavia just walked in, and that's why you're that's why you're throwing that. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't know where she. No, no. I'm sure that it's, no, it is because to 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 that point, and I don't think that as black men that we give. You know, this is just my opinion that we give. You know, our black sisters enough credit, but that's just a side note. Um, but what I wanted to say. Um, Oh my goodness! Now I'm do I'm doing what Ryan did, but I just just lost my my point before you said that because I thought you that I thought that was a very good point um, that you brought up, Professor uh, Audrey. Goodness gracious! I was just getting ready to say something before that, but I had to just get that out of the way. Oh, the question to, to go back to a jump. That one of the, one of the questions on how can uh, whites be uh, allies? I, I wanted to I, I wanted to an answer that question. I think the the way that we have to break it down, which is, I, I encourage people to go and read this book, White Fragility, I think it's an awesome book, is that when, is that when people, how do people define racism, right? And so there's this notion that, you know, that racism is a, is this, is racism is calling someone the N word or racism is, is, uh, that, that it's just like people think that racism is just negative. How, how do I say it? It's like if you call someone a racist, right? If you call, you know, a white person get called a racist, you get offended because you think that the word racist means that you're a bad person, right? And to understand racism, is, it's more so of a system, right? Racism is a system that is designed to keep whites in power, right? So it's not, so it's not necessarily like, okay, you are racist, so that means that you're an ugly, mean person, and you, you know, wish that people get mixed. So, so it's like, yeah, I mean, you know, if that was what, if that's what racism is defined as, then yeah, I'll be pissed off if someone called me a racist, right? And so it's this thing where you have to understand what racism is. And the reason that whites have, have privilege is because you're part of a system that benefits you uh, economically and in almost every sense of the word. And so it's not that it's a bad thing because if you're born, if you have a child, they're born into a system that already benefits them, right? And so to in order to become an ally um, to the black movement is that understanding that as a white person, you are part of a system that was created to benefit you and that that, um, and that is technically up to our white allies and our white friends to dismantle racism. As a black person, as a black man, there's nothing that really I can do or blacks can really do on his own to dismantle ra racism without the help of the system. And that people who are part of the system have to be the ones to step up to dismantle it. And so, um, and so the way that you become an ally, the way that you become a friend is necessarily understanding what racism is doesn't mean that you are a bad person. It doesn't mean that, it does not mean, you know, yes, you know, bigotry, yes, like Donald Trump, he, to me, he is, in, he, he's something else. He, he's a bigot, you know, he, he is beyond, he's, he's beyond that, right? There's no words to describe. He's just nasty and mean and cruel and the stuff that he says is just ridiculous, right? But then you have people who, you know, you have, because, I don't want to go, I don't want to blab on too much, but I think it's a really good book. I think that whites have to understand the system that they are privileged to be a part of. Um, and that, and that when you're born white, it is a privilege to be a part of that system, but it's going to really take white people to dismantle racism in, in, in this country. And it's really not up to black people to do it because we don't have the power to do it. Um, we don't control the, we don't have the power to dismantle it. Um, only white people do. And so we absolutely need uh, white people to, to, to stand up, to dismantle it, to say, you know, this is what we've created. This is what our ancestors have created. This is what our grandfathers and grandfathers have created. And we're going to dismantle it to make sure that we can build a country that is equal and fair and actually stand, that, uh, create a country um, to, actually, to actually reflect what we say that it's supposed to be, which is uh, equal rights and justice for all people. Amen. Um, I would also add, I mean, and I think, you know, this conversation that we're having is, 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 is part 
for part of the self-education, self-educating that we're doing. Um, I think everyone, uh, it's, it's a process. If, if there's one book I can recommend, um, The Color of Law, which is a wonderful book to talk about housing in this country and um, redlining. And I think to have an, an awareness of how um, white supremacy was um, a design effect by the federal government. I mean, you, th you think about um, neighborhoods, you know, how do we talk about neighborhoods? How do we talk about schools? What makes a good school a good school? What makes a bad school a bad school? Um, why do we even have black communities? Um, the notion of, of redlining and not allowing people to move to buy houses where they want to buy houses up until um, 1968. And you look at their racist housing co covenants where um, that I've read in some of my own research where it was illegal to sell to your house to a person of um, African descent, Ethiopian descent. Um, some of them had Mongolian, um, uh, Hebrew. It's, it's, it's amazing how this culture, how, how this country um, purposefully designed the racial makeup of, of, of neighborhoods. And um, so, so when you look at it from an institutional level, a systemic, it's, 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 a, it's a large problem, it's a huge problem. And I think as individuals, I think we have to keep reading. And as far as white allyship, um, how, how willing are you able to risk your own reputation? when that person is telling a racist joke, right? Or you're in the, um, in the boardroom of a hiring and someone says, well, we don't want to interview the person because their name is Jamal. Um, there are things that we can think about on the individual level um, uh, because I think as far as white allyship, I think it can do the most good in white communities and white conversations, not just at the Thanksgiving dinner table, but at your job. Um, I've had friends who are women of color in academia who are the only one in the room and they may speak to some diversity issue and everyone else is silent. But after the meeting, she'll get emails saying, I'm glad you said something about that. I'm glad you said something about that. But the thing is, why didn't they also say it in the room? Right? Why, why, why is the burden on the black and brown people in these spaces? As, as, as Ryan was saying, that sometimes we're the only person and, and it'd be nice if there's someone else to raise some of these issues. So, so I, think that's, I think that's one thing um, on an individual level um, that white people can think about in, in, in when it's an all white environment. Mm. And just going off of Derek's point, you know, when you're at your job or you're in the great schools that you're sending your kids to, and you may see one African American student there or coworker or, you know, administrator, what have you, ask yourself, why is there only one here? Or why is there none here? Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that I think will, you know, open your mind up as to, huh, why there's only one type of bo voice being heard, you know? And it, it's just good, just like in all things to have more. I think we also need to bring in a, that we're coming into an election season and it's on every one of us to make sure that we're electing officials because it is a government problem that we have. And you have to fix government from the people that are inside of it. So we need to really elect people that represent our communities and represent the values that we want to see and stop just keep putting incumbents in there. And I think it's Devon's work with his group that really helps to elevate candidates of color that maybe wouldn't be out there, that wouldn't be as well known to help 
change our landscape, our political landscape. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we you know, we, we have to reject uh, anything that's against, um, we have to reject a political system that does not uh, include uh, everyone um, and reject uh, bigotry and reject racism within our government because these are the ones who are voting uh, on legislations and policies that can either uh, move us forward um, to a more inclusive country or keep us the same or even take us back. Um, and so, yeah, we do have to be mindful um, that our vote is powerful. Uh, you know, even in this country, I mean, with the election of Barack Obama, um, you know, that, that was a proud moment, but we have to continue to do more. Um, and we have to, not just in the presidential race, but even locally, we have to make sure that we uh, are paying attention to who our local elected officials are, who our council members are, who, who uh, you know, what, what the mayor is doing, and we need to hold them uh, very accountable um, to our community. Um, and when we do that, uh, once people understand the power of their vote and their voice, uh, there is no doubt that uh, we can make a difference uh, and, make, and make a change. And we have, just going right off of what Kale and what Devon were just talking about, Shelly, if you want to unmute yourself, Shelly has a question about distinction. Shelly, if you want to articulate that for us. Well, I j to me, it sounds as though, and I don't need to be on video, thank you. Um, uh, to me, it sounds as though th th it's a very binary question. Either you're perpetuating the systemic racism and white supremacy, or you're dismantling it. There's just, there's no comfortable middle ground. You, I, I just feel like it's one or the other. I don't know how you just hang out in the middle. And I just, I guess I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I think for me, it's more visceral to talk about sexism sometimes, but I think that like when, when you have, you can have women who perpetuate patriarchy, right? Because they can say nothing when they see something wrong, right? Um, so even if they do nothing, it's like there's, there's complicity in it, right? And so um, when Derek was saying like, if there's a hiring meeting and people are openly discriminating against someone and people don't say anything, right? That's a moment when it's binary right? But I don't think that it's always binary. Like, I think that, th again, there's so many intersectional parts of identity that it becomes really messy when you have gender and sexuality and class all kind of mix in. Um, and so I think it, it's, it is, it's more complicated than just a binary decision. But when, you know, if we see in practice, there's something wrong that's happening in our work environment or, or our families or in our schools and we don't say anything, then that's not really taking the middle ground, I don't think. That's just kind of being part of the problem, right? Um, but I think that, again, like I think that there, I'm answering your question in two parts, Shelley. I'm just saying that there's, when there are decisions to be made, right? And people either say something or they don't say anything, right? Then that's where, when it's binary. But when it's something about when there are schisms in identity and that we have different ways in which people are minoritized that are clashing, I think it becomes really complicated and it's not so binary anymore. Thanks, Audrey. I appreciate it. Bedroom, window, four. I think we have one more question. Um, Mike Major was getting to some of the historical elements of this uh, larger issue. Uh, Don Wallace, if you want to unmute yourself, this is a, a history professor at the Naval Academy, has a historical pers perspective uh, to ask about and share. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, great panel. Um, thank you for letting me attend. Um, the point I put to the panelist was one really about um, just language, about naming 
what the problem is. Uh, I spent an hour in a faculty meeting, uh, probably not supposed to talk about this, but who cares, you need to talk about it, um, where there was just a resolution to say, um, you know, maybe we should rename buildings named after people who um, perpetuated and used uh, the United States government to perpetuate uh, the enslavement of people. And we couldn't get a conversation going because immediately what came out was um, heritage arguments and lost cause arguments and, you know, and many things. And, and what, was, what became clear to me is we got into a, to a debate that was really a delaying tactic. Let's debate this issue about heritage, about lost cause. And we never got to the point, which is we're not making any structural changes. We're not making any fundamental changes. I've been in this job 12 years, and every three years they change the uh, leadership. <laughs> uh, I've never had a person of color in my chain of command. Okay, I've never, um, I've had one woman. Um, and they turn and say, you know, that we're having these smaller arguments because we refuse to name that there is really a problem. And so I think I use the term apartheid when I teach this in class, um, and that if we don't recognize this isn't apartheid, we don't say it's an apartheid. And I study, I don't study American history, I study European history, where there are a lot of uh, tragedies where the nation had to come to grips with that tragedies afterwards, but they only did so because they were so roundly defeated as a system. And I think the problem here is the American system seems to be working for so many people that if the system's not going to collapse, I, I wonder where we get the moral courage to start to bring it down. Um, and asking people to it to at least, you know, so I think the, the the national government has to be a player. They have to step in. They have to say for 150 years we've had an apartheid system. Um, we need to acknowledge it, we need to atone for it, and we need to pay for it. Um, and until we do that, uh, you know, I think we get distracted into arguments that are just delaying tactics because, as you know, King said, you wait long enough and the American people go shopping again. You know, and, um, and so I don't, know, I don't even know if I have a question other than, um, uh, as Jack and Joan know, I'm a bit of a pessimist about most things. So I just, this is encouraging to me. Um, I just, I, I, I wish I knew a path forward for, for the more courage and maybe you can um, make me more optimistic on that. And I'll, you can mute me, Jack. <laughs> just good to hear your voice, brother. <laughs> yeah. If I could say something um, to that, um, I used to live in Charleston, South Carolina, and um, there's this adoration of, of the Confederacy and things of that sort. And I re also remember when I was teaching at the Naval Academy, um, there was a midshipman who had a Confederate flag on their car driving around on campus. And, and I talked to some folks in leadership saying, you know, hey, this is, this is problematic. Um, for me personally, you know, my parents are from the South. Um, my father was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama, um, and his parents and their grandparents. So Southern heritage for me is completely different than so Southern heritage for other folks. Um, and I don't understand this, you know, ideology of, 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 of of the Confederacy. Um, I do know this. Um, I was born in Pennsylvania. Um, and General Lee, the Confederate general who was marching up on Gettysburg along the way was capturing free African Americans and selling them down into slavery. That's part of his military campaign. I mean, of course, that part is not talked about, right? And so when you talk about heritage, it's always seen from one perspective, right? It's seen from a certain perspective. I mean, maybe this is part of the invisibility. 
And so this is the this is the pain, this is the anger, this is the the hurt that for a lot of black people that folks don't understand. I mean, up until two days ago, they took down that John Calhoun statue in downtown Charleston. And and you can't find too many people who don't love visiting Charleston. But for African Americans, I mean, that's ground zero. Charleston is ground zero for white supremacy. 40% of all African Americans can trace their lineage through Charleston, South Carolina. And you have a man like John Calhoun, who died even before the Civil War, right, who said that the black person's place is in slavery. And matter of fact, um, Ellison even even hinted at that when he when he said to you know um, what did he say the uh, peculiar uh, the peculiar disposition of eyes the peculiar institution of slavery the particular you know particular I said I mean the peculiar labor which was slavery this is coming from John Calhoun where slavery is a um, is not a ne necessary uh, evil it's a particular good so for for black people in this country it's it's not about um heritage this is about the the willful bondage of fellow human beings and and i i think the naval academy um would do well in in changing some of those buildings i love the fact that the u.s marine corps has banned the confederate flag and um um, I think these conversations will have to continue. But and to make my final point, we also have to ask the question, right? Why does it continue to take black death for these questions to occur, for these changes to occur? Why did it have to take people to be killed at a Bible study in a, in a Charleston church for Confederate flags to come down from State House? Why does it take um, a man to be publicly murdered, right, for, for these things, for these changes to occur. So let's try to, let's, let's, let's try to go all the way. Let's not have to um, keep having these conversations. We're here, we're at a special moment, we're ha having a conversation about it, um, and, and, and we have to keep the momentum going. Okay, as I tell my students, I'm gonna get off my soapbox now, I'm preaching, so. So I was at that meeting, Don, and um, I, when I heard someone say, you know, I'm deeply offended by this term white supremacy, it reminded me of Aluo's book, actually, when she says, you know, if I call someone a cracker, maybe it ruins their day, right? If someone calls me the N-word, it could mean a loss, loss of employment. It could even mean death, right? Um, and so, yes, you could you know, you could offend someone, right? But usually when we call out racism or racist acts or white supremacy, we're not just trying to label things, right? We're actually saying, here's where things need to change, right? Like these, these discourses are racist. These buildings or these monuments stand for racist things. And so let's change them, right? And so it's not just to label, label people or things, right? It's, it's a call for change. And so I think that with these buildings, I mean, if we want to keep the name of the names of these buildings that are deeply offensive, we could maybe write like a little context for it, right? Like this person was known for, you know, enslaving this many African Americans, right? You know, I mean, I think that that is what's called for in this in this time. And that goes to Mike's question too, about like whether you know, people being racist, wanting to be evil or bad. Um, but again, I, I always teach my students that race is a discourse. We can choose to reproduce it or we can choose to dismantle it, right? And so um, it's a choice. I'll get off my soapbox now too. And like Derek said, it, took, it takes black death, right, for us to have these conversations. And just for us to have this panel discussion and everything right now, I think it took a global pandemic mm -hmm. for everyone to sit down and really see black death. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? No, I, yeah, no, I'm, 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 I agree with what everyone said. I, I think it was like a snowball effect because 
when COVID hit, the they started posting all of the disparities information out on um, how COVID has disproportionately affected African Americans. Then you had the Ahmaud Arbery shooting, where two white guys went out and chased the guy down and, and shot him. And then two weeks later, you have you know uh, George Floyd. And then and I think I think probably a couple weeks before then, it was like Breonna Taylor just sleeping in her house and got shot. So I think the snowball effect of man, why does this keep happening? Uh, the African Americans had brought us to this point where now we're 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 just now talking about this. So, I mean, I you know, I don't I don't know why I don't know why it takes this to to get this going. But I think it's a great discussion. I think it's uh, I think I you know I think there's a shift happening in the country. Um, I think that what we're witnessing is uh, people who are now uh, opening up their eyes. And I you know I'm very optimistic. I'm very um, I I feel good about where we hit where where we are heading, um, and you know despite the rhetoric uh, from you know so many of the white supremacists, including Donald Trump, despite all that stuff that is going on, I really feel like the country uh, is heading in a good direction. Because when I go out to these protests, when I you know when when I'm talking to people, I'm talking to a lot of amazing people from all different backgrounds, races, colors, uh, who who understand what's happening and want to make a difference. I think the fact that uh, Jack, uh, Ryan, and Eric, and you guys are putting this discussion on, uh, you know, you guys have also made a contribution to the pack. Uh, you recognize what's happening. You're using your business, which is very, you know, you know when your business when you're a business person and an entrepreneur, you know, some entrepreneurs are very leery and afraid to uh, use that business as a platform to speak out um, on things like this um, because you don't want to offend customers. You don't want to offend, you know, you, you don't want to lose money and thing, things like that. So for you guys to have this open discussion, to say that this is important um, and we should be talking about this, uh, you know, I give a lot of credit to you guys for being open um, and being on the right side of history. And I really think that we're that we're going to see a change, um, just just based on the fact that people like you know all you guys, Kelly, Jack, John, Shelley, Audrey, all you guys are standing up and you guys are taking a step forward to being on the right side of of history and just doing what is right. And so I appreciate that. We appreciate it. I, I'm so grateful for this partnership, Devon. It's awesome. And I, I mean, not to, not to minimize the seriousness of this conversation, but, you know, just for full transparency, it's just because Eric really likes ice cream. And <laughs> I knew it was a catch. I knew it was a catch. <laughs> I knew it was a catch. He's still <laughs> counting. He's still counting on that darn truck. <laughs> no, I gotta, I gotta, yeah, no, absolutely. No. Um, so just so I, People may be confused of what's of what's going on. Um, so I was the CEO of an a ice cream company in, to, in, in Baltimore called Tahaka Brothers Ice Cream. It's a socially conscious ice cream company um, that is gearing up. Actually, it's, it's, it's finalizing it to be um, 100% uh, uh, owned by. Um, so right now, it's still owned by a nonprofit, but it's 90 it's 99% operated by young Af African American males. And will be owned by the guy. So it's a worker. It's a co-op. Um, and uh, you know, I was CEO for four years, and we basically used the ice cream as a vehicle for social change. And you know, um, it's an amazing company. It's called Tahaka Brothers. If you haven't had it, I will Google Tahaka Brothers ice cream. Um, if you're in the Baltimore, Glen Burnie area, they do deliveries. We're in a ton of restaurants. Um, and apparently, Eric and uh, Jack loves the ice cream. <laughs> and I knew it was a reason why they reached out to me because they wanted to try to get free ice cream. So, so don't let this uh, conversation fool you. This is all. I'm only on this panel for one thing only. That's to bring Jack and him a pint of ice cream after they <laughs> do a good workout, a CrossFit uh, uh, workout. So, Rusters and ice cream. <laughs> Rusters and ice cream. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what. Um, 
I want to be respectful for, for with folks' time. We said, you know, we try to keep it to about eight o'clock in, in typical fashion, we've run long. Um, but I would also, I want to make uh, a final invite to any of the panelists, members, uh, if you guys have any final things you want to say, kind of close us out, by all means, uh, it's your, it's your panel, it's your platform. Yeah. I think uh, Marita's question didn't get answered, which was how do brown, how can brown people help mm -hmm. black people? Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that just in case anyone had any, um, any good answers. Um, but I, my immediate thing was, um, I think that to recognize that people from all minoritized backgrounds are discriminated against on a daily basis, um, but to recognize that they're discriminated against differently um, is important and to come from a place, Jack is actually really good about teaching me about that, like coming from a place of humility, right, of not assuming. Um, and so that, I know that sounds vague, but, um, but just recognizing that there is commonality of discrimination, but just different kinds of discrimination. Thanks, Audrey. Thanks for catching that too. Yeah. I appreciated being a part of this panel and I, my suggestion to everyone is, you know, continue to have these conversations. It doesn't have to be, you know, just a book club discussion. Like this is real life and this is every day and just go out and be your best and try to learn just like the rest of us. Um, well, I really enjoy it. Jack, bring me back for the next book club discussion. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> I can participate virtually. I mean, you know. <laughs> um, but this we'll buy this, in, man. <laughs> this was great, and, and thanks for recommending this book. I mean, I really enjoyed it. Um, I might have been channel channeling some of it or referencing some of it in some of my my talks. So. Um, the proper credit that she deserved, as, as Audrey said, um, and as Devon also said, um, and as a person with, with five sisters, I mean, I think um, we don't often talk about the, the importance of black women in the, in the black freedom movement. And not only that, in terms of Black Lives Matter, um, this um, thing about the hashtag Say Her Name campaign, um, um, and it's when we say Black Lives Matter, we we don't just mean Black men, Black women, um, uh, trans Black people. Um, it's 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 the Black body um, in of itself. And and um, I really appreciate the conversation and being part of this panel and and getting to meet everyone. So thanks thanks for that. So good to see you, man. So it's, good. I like the hair. That's you caught me off guard with that. Yeah. It's a challenge. It said to go. I'm gonna try and go a year. So, cut it right before, right, cut it right before quarantine. This is now retired hair. I just wanted to say, say, well, I, if I just have a minute. So I posted a link in the in the thing. Um, so I, you know, I have a special place too. Uh, I have really good friends down in Montgomery, Alabama, and um, two amazing people that I've had the privilege of sitting so it's two different people I had an amazing opportunity to sit and um and talk to and to learn from uh, i think you guys should look them up when you have a, uh, a chance to you can google it one uh, one of my mentors name is nelson uh Morgan. and nelson uh he was i'm sorry you can't you're running into the same building he's trying to play this game <laughs> <laughs> and so Nelson, uh, he was Dr. King's barber. And so every time I go to Alabama, I would go and get my hair cut at the same barber shop that Dr. King got his hair cut. And by the same barber. Um, again, his name is Nelson uh, Molden. Um, and I put a link uh, in here for another uh, mentor. His name is Reverend Robert Gretz. Robert Gretz and his wife, Janine, they are white. So he was a 
He was a white pastor of an all black church during the civil rights movement. Um, he was best friends with uh, Rosa Parks and had got it and his house was bombed. I don't know if I can share a screen, but I just want to share this because I, I think I think it's amazing. Oh, I think the host is able to attend from Shan Screen. If you can you to give me Yep, there you go. You got it. I just want to Okay, hold on. Hold on. One second. Can you give me one second? I help you. Hold on. Hold on. It's broken. Hold on one second. So I'm just I'm just I'm just gonna share this one thing because I, I I think it's awesome. Can you guys uh see my screen? So this is so this is Reverend uh, Robert and his wife, they are amazing people. So when I go down to Al Alabama, I always make my way to go see them. I sit down and we, we usually eat. So hold on, this is right, hold on. We usually sit down, this is them, this is at their house. They march in the civil rights movement. They were best friends with the Parks, had their house burned uh, in bond. They love popcorn. So every time I go there, we sit, we eat popcorn and we drink champagne. <laughs> and we sit and we talk. We have these book discussions. So this, so this is us again. And uh, and I think you know their story is amazing. So as book club lovers, if you they have a ton of articles that's written on them about their involvement in the civil rights movement. Um, here's a, let me see. There's, yeah, that's another. Yeah, and so they are incredible people. And so when you ask about how you can get involved, I just think that their story is amazing. Um, and their involvement in the civil rights movement and their, and their story is unbelievable. Um, and it's, you know, uh, that's what, that's Arthur Cox from the middle. But, um, but yeah, so if you read their story, you will get inspired by them. I, I did have a picture of Nelson, uh, the bar. So he usually cuts my hair when I go, when I, oh, here you go. Yeah, here, here you go, right here. This is my, this is, uh, Nelson, he's a great barber. He cut Dr. King's hair. So every time I go to Alabama, he cuts he cuts my hair. He has a movie getting. Uh, he's currently uh, sorry. He currently has a movie that they're getting ready to make on him, and he has a documentary that he's been a part of. And uh, his story is incredible too. Mm. So that's all I wanted to do. So that's all I wanted to say. That was impressive, dude. That was impressive. Managing that. <laughs> Get that screen shared. Those are awesome pictures. Thanks, Devon. Man, you're so freaking cool. All right. Um, well, I'll, going once, going twice. Sold. Um, I will say uh, thank you to the five panelists. This was uh, exceeded any expectations I had. You guys are absolutely awesome. Thank you for all the folks who joined us and, uh, and asked some questions. I really appreciate it. And I will echo the sentiments. This is just the beginning of the conversations that we want to be having with our community. You know, Eric and I wrote it on the wall, be curious, be consistent, be courageous. And I think um, the challenge of finding that moral courage starts with us. And so we're on board. Uh, for the attendees and panelists, you'll get a survey in the, in the mail or the e in your email. Um, with maybe some larger, or longer spots where you can um, provide some suggestions. If you got ideas for other books in the future, if you like this platform, if you hated this platform, feel free. Uh, it goes to me and Eric, so uh, you won't hurt my feelings. And uh, and he's growing a tougher skin with uh, constructive criticism. So please be brutally honest. Let us know what you think and uh, and stuff you'd like to see in the future because we're on board with with taking this on. So. Thank you to everyone and enjoy your weekend. And we'll, uh, we'll see you on the flip side. On the creek. We'll see you on the creek. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> well, yeah, so bye-bye. See you guys. <laughs>